to Exodus 34. Exodus 34, verses 1 through 9. <clears throat> and as you turn to Exodus 34, uh, my question for you this, this morning is, why don't we become best friends with everyone we meet? Or if you're single and uh, interested in getting married, why don't you just marry the first person that's available? And uh, the answer is not just because that would be crazy. Yes, that would be crazy. But it's crazy because, <clears throat> excuse me, your best friend or your spouse, they are invited into the most intimate parts of your life. And so before that happens, you want to know what kind of person you'd be living with. Are they quick to anger? Or are they patient? Will they forgive you? How quickly will they forgive you? Do they keep their word? Uh, are they fun to be with? Uh, do they want you to grow and mature in Jesus? And not just that, will they actually help you grow and mature in Jesus? Will they help uh, be like iron sharpening iron in your life and your faithfulness to, to Christ? See, Jesus knows that when he brings us into a relationship with himself, it's like bringing us into relationships of husband and wife or best friends. We're going to have those same kinds of questions about living with Jesus. What kind of God are you? What does living with you look like on a day-to-day -day basis? When I fail, Jesus, how are you going to respond? How quickly will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? Will you be patient with me? See, those are very good questions. And as a matter of fact, Jesus invites those questions because he wants us to know him and he wants us to know how his love and forgiveness and his holiness will be lived out with us. And so that's what our passage is about this morning. Exodus 34, 1 through 9, uh, as we're going to see, is uh, where the Lord proclaims his name to Moses in the context of sin and in the context of failure. And what you're going to see is that the name of the Lord means that Jesus lives with us as the God who patiently and graciously forgives and sanctifies. Uh, so let's read our passage, we'll pray, and then we'll reflect on these three points together. Learning the Lord's name, the Lord lives with us in forgiveness and mercy, and then finally the Lord lives with us in sanctifying grace. So let's read Exodus 34, 1 through 9, pray, and then we'll reflect on all this together. Exodus 34, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, uh, cut for yourselves two tablets of stone like the first. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by morning and come up in the, in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite the mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hands two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Thus far the reading of what can only be God's own word. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we uh, very much want to know you as the God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We want to understand how your name reveals the way that you live with us. But Lord, we know that we will not in any meaningful, life-changing way unless your Spirit blesses your word to us. And so therefore we pray that your Spirit would give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to believe your word. Father, may the words of my mouth as your preacher, and may the meditation of all our hearts as those called to hear and respond to your word may all now be pleasing in your sight. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So the first thing we're going to reflect on is learning the Lord's name. In verse 5, we read that Jesus proclaimed the name of the Lord to Moses. Uh, the beginning of Exodus actually tells us why the name Lord in all capital letters is so important. In Exodus chapter 1, we find Israel enslaved by an Egyptian nation that was genocidally working them to death. Uh, and then Moses is born, he's rescued by Pharaoh's daughter, and then he eventually has to flee to the desert. And then while he's in the desert, Moses gets married and becomes a shepherd for his father-in-law. Uh, that's all in chapter 2, by the way. It covers a lot of ground. And then in chapter 3, God appears to Moses at the burning bush, and he tells him that through Moses, God is going to save Israel out of slavery. And in response, you have this very important conversation in chapter 3, verse 13. I'm going to read that for you. Uh, then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So here God gives both his full name and a shorter form of, like, of that name. So like my name is Matthew, but people call me Matt. God says, my name is I am who I am. And then he gives a shorter version, I am. But I want to think about that longer version for a second. So in terms of the Hebrew language, the grammar behind this phrase, I am who I am, uh, that translation is reasonable, but it's frankly not the best translation. As our knowledge of ancient Hebrew grows, most biblical scholars now recognize that the best translation is, I will be named by what I will do. That's the best translation. I will be named, I will be called by what I will do. And then the shortened form of that would be something like, I'm that God, the God who did those things. Or to unpack it, our God is the God who did those things for us. And then for a variety of reasons, which we're not going to go into this morning, that shortened name becomes the Lord written in all capital letters. So all that to say, when Moses asks God for his name, God says, I will reveal my name by what I am going to do. In other words, God doesn't say, my name's Bob. You can call me Bob. Uh, he says, I'll show you who I am by my actions. And then once you've seen me act, that will be the name that you will call me by. So what then does God go and do? Well, he goes and defeats a genocidal power. He saves the Israelites. And also, if you read Exodus very carefully, he also saves a bunch of Egyptians who repented and believed too as he leads them out of uh, Israel through the Red Sea. He meets his people's needs in the desert with manna and quail and gives them water from places that there should not be water. See, up to this point, God acts by delivering them from a living death, meeting their needs, answering their fears, and hearing their prayers. But now, now there is a new issue in God's life with his people as they're learning the kind of God they're following, as they're learning his name by what he will do. The new issue is, how will Jesus act toward our sin and our faithlessness? What is Jesus going to do when his people betray him, and when they and we worship idols like they just did uh, earlier on, this the previous chapter, when they made the golden calf. That's the issue here. What will God do with the fact that his people, whom he has saved and who he wants to live with, are sinners? They are not perfect. What will Jesus do? That's why God proclaiming the name of the Lord in all capital letters, I am, to Moses is so important here. Because what God says to Moses in verses 6 through 7 is also what he says to us. So he says, the Lord, the Lord, or I am, I am. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Uh, we are going to unpack that more in a second, but essentially God says, 
My name, Moses, is the God who is merciful and gracious and sanctifying. God's name is the description of the life he lives with us as sinners. God does mercy. He does grace. He does sanctification for us. And this is why you'll see the description of God used throughout the Bible. And it's why in Philippians chapter 2, I referenced a sermon I preached on this uh, a few years ago in uh, the the newsletter that goes out. But you'll read in Philippians chapter 2, Therefore God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name, I am, that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, is I am, to the glory of God the Father. Now, did you hear all that? The name Lord is given to Jesus. The name Jesus is given to Lord because Jesus is the God who lives with us in mercy and love and sanctification. What shall I tell the people uh, who has sent me? What name shall I give them? Beloved, we give them the name Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who meets us in mercy and love and sanctification, who saves us from the living death that is enslavement to sin and meets our needs, making a way for us and providing life for us in the wilderness when there is no way. The God we worship is the Lord. His name is Jesus. And by the way, uh, Jesus means, and kids, this is good for you to know, God saves. So given that, Given this name, let's move on to our second point and let's reflect on the fact that uh, God's that uh, God's life with us is one of forgiveness and mercy. And I just want to look very briefly at each word God uses to name His life with us, to describe the way He does life with us, the actions He takes in His life with us, so that we can know what to call Him, so that we can understand why we call Him Jesus. So the first thing God says to His people, the people who have betrayed Him the people who have grumbled against him, the people who have struggled to follow him, the first thing he says is, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. So Jesus is merciful, which means he does not treat us the way we deserve to be treated. He treats us better. And he's gracious. The Hebrew word for gracious there only describes God in the Bible. And what it means is that Jesus hears the cries for help that no one else will listen to or that no one else can act on. Like at the beginning of the Exodus, when God hears the groans of his people, groans that the Egyptians' gods ignore, groans that the Egyptians cause and that could not be alleviated by any other power, because at this time in human history, no human power is going to stop Egypt from abusing the Israelites, but God could. Jesus was gracious to them. And beloved, we've experienced Jesus' graciousness too. If you've ever been in a relationship where you thought, this thing is dead and it's not coming back and I am heartbroken, and then you've experienced the redeeming work of Jesus as his mercy and grace have come and brought life from death and made a way where there is no way and brought reconciliation and healing and renewal, you know what it means that God is a God who is gracious and merciful. That's what it means. Like I know as Christians, we often talk about following Jesus being a way of suffering and hardship, and that's not wrong. We follow the God who is named the man of sorrows. There is going to be suffering and hardship and difficulty in our life with Jesus, but we also follow the God who is named the Prince of Peace, the one who is called the living one, who brings life from death, which means that also with Jesus, we will know resurrection and life and healing and renewal. Our God is merciful and gracious. Jesus lives with us in mercy and in grace, not treating us as our sins deserve and answering our needs as only he can, bringing life and healing and making a way where there is no way. And that's just one name that uh, that God gives Because not only is Jesus merciful and gracious, he's also slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Uh, Slow to anger obviously means that God is patient. 
And his patience really has two aspects to it. The first is, is that Jesus is telling us that he is in control of his emotional life. God does not lash out in anger or frustration. He doesn't explode. I mean, what a wonderful word to hear right after we've sinned, right? Like, yes, what you've done has grieved me, but I am in control of my grief, and I am in control of my response. I am not going to beat you or throw a fit or stomp away or overreact. That's part of what it means that Jesus is patient. But for Jesus to be patient also means that he's willing to endure our failures and to give us time to grow and mature. And this is an aspect of Jesus' patience we've been thinking about a lot recently. And it's good for us to see it's built into the very name of God, slow to anger. When, when God brings Israel up out of Egypt, he says in chapter 13, verse 17, he says, when Pharaoh let the people of Israel go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest these people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. That's an example of God being patient with us, with his people, and giving us time to grow and being willing to endure with us and live with us in his sanctifying grace as he takes us through the necessary times of wilderness walking so he can mature us and grow us. Another example of his patience would be uh, the new laws that God gave Israel to teach them how to live in uh, loving holiness with him and with each other. Right? Jesus understands that we need time and instruction to grow and to mature. God did not give the Ten Commandments and be like, now you better be perfect or it's done. He gives the Ten Commandments and then what? Year after year, day after day, moment after moment, he works with his people to work them into the heart, their hearts and lives so they could grow in maturity. See, Jesus knows that we will fail and we will need forgiveness. And Jesus is patient with those needs. And he, he chooses even longer, more indirect routes to accommodate our own limitations and frailty as he grows us in his time and in his way. Because remember, Jesus is never in a hurry. Related to that, Jesus shows steadfast love and faithfulness. Steadfast love and faithfulness, they go together because steadfast love means the care that I vowed to give you. And this is why steadfast love is sometimes translated uh, by Reformed folk as covenant love, because it's the love that God has promised to show us as his people. And the closest example I think that we have to this in our day, and it's an example that actually Jesus uses throughout the Bible to refer to this kind of love is wedding vows, right? The promise that I will love you and you will love me, and then that love will endure to the ups and to the downs of life. See, God says, my love will not appear only in times of ease and blessing, but also in times of hardship and suffering. I will love you when you are in heaven and it's easy, and I will love you when you are in the valley of the shadow of death. And then faithfulness goes along with that. Faithfulness means that his word is reliable. All of us have had promises that have been broken to us, either intentionally or because someone just overpromised beyond their ability to deliver, or because the suffering involved in keeping that promise was just too great to be endured. Uh, Jesus tells us here, I am faithful. I live with you in faithfulness to my covenant love. I keep all my promises, even if it costs me the glories of heaven and the sufferings of hell. Jesus says, I will love you in life and I will love you in death, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health, as long as we both shall live, he could say. And since Jesus lives forever and we live forever in him, that love will endure forever. And we also hear God say his name is revealed by his keeping steadfast love to thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Uh, here, thousands or thousand generations, some of your footnotes will have that there as a possible translation, that is the equivalent to our expression gazillion. It's just in a way to express a humongous number. But I think it's interesting to think about why God chooses thousands and not just like 
my people or always? Like, why use a number? And one of the reasons why I think Jesus uses a number here is because he wants us to see not only the limitlessness of his love, but also the individuality of his love. By using a countable number, God wants each of his people to realize that he keeps his steadfast love to you and to me. And as I was thinking about this this week, I thought of a a good analogy. Uh, You'll hear a lot of people talk about how they love America, but then when they talk about their fellow Americans, you're like, maybe you don't love every individual American. Maybe you love the concept or the idea or a certain subset, right? But you don't love every single one. Beloved, Jesus wants us to understand that when he looks at it, he doesn't look at, I love the church, but not that part of the church. Uh, I love my people, maybe not them. He loves every individual member of his people. Keeping steadfast love to the thousands of his people, the countable numbers of his people from generation to generation. There is no separation for him. Jesus loves us individually. What a beautiful word. When Jesus walks with us, he doesn't walk with us as an amorphous mass of people. He walks with us and loves us as the individuals he has created us to be with all of our personality quirks. We all have some personality quirks. With all of our personal histories. Right? Jesus keeps his steadfast love individually to each one of the thousand gazillion people who live with him in Jesus. And then finally, we hear God say, in the context of failure, as he's walking with us in our brokenness, that he is the God who forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. And I know this is a lot, but I think this is, this is so good to just focus in on these for a second. Iniquity means pollution. That's what iniquity means. It means pollution, the way that sin spreads out from us to others and draws them in to our bad behavior and way of life. Uh, one of the ways that the Bible thinks about sin is as poison that affects other people. An example of this pollution in the Bible that I think is interesting to think about, Abraham's sin of lying about his wife pollutes Isaac, poisons him, and he lies about his wife. Jacob, his son, is jealous of Esau and lies to steal his birthright. And that response to jealousy pollutes Jacob's children who in their jealousy lie about the death of Joseph. God forgiving iniquity, forgiving this pollution means something very powerful. It means he not only forgives the way that we harm each other by teaching them to sin in the kinds of ways that we ourselves sin, but it also means that he is going to undo its effect in our lives, cleansing us and those we love from its power. God's forgiveness is not only power, it's transformation And when Jesus says he walks with us and forgives our iniquity, he means he forgives us in the way that we draw each other in and also the way in which he starts to pull that sin out of our lives so that we don't do it anymore, so that we are more holy with each other. And the same is true of God forgiving our trespasses, which usually refers to our intentional sins. That is the times when we know that we're doing wrong and we're doing it anyway. You know the thing where you're yelling at somebody and your brain is like, I should stop, and your mouth just continues going on, that would be a trespass. Or where you see someone in need, like your siblings, and you're like, I should get up and help them. And you do not, because you just don't wanna. That would be a trespass. You're not loving your, uh, your neighbor as you would be loved, right? Do uh, love one another as you would have them love you. Do good to each other as you have them do good to you. There's the verse, right? That is a trespass. And it's also true of our sins generally. And here that word for sin is just the normal catch-all term for every bad thing we do, either intentionally or unintentionally, that that breaks God's law or doesn't keep God's law. God says that when we live with him, he forgives these things. He forgives our sins. He forgives our trespasses and he forgives our iniquities that we have learned and passed on to others. 
That is the name of the God we serve. That is Jesus. What does it look like to live with this God? It looks like to live with a God who works redemptively, patiently, mercifully, graciously in the lives of his people individually so that he can redeem us and bring us safely to himself. But like I said, his forgiveness is not only pardon, it's sanctifying power. And that brings us to our last point very quickly, which is the Lord lives with us in sanctifying grace. And here I just kind of want to pick up on some of the things I was talking about, pollution. This is actually from the last half of verse 7. We read, But who, our God is also one, who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So, I know that this statement raises a lot of questions. And the best way to answer them, I think, is to reflect on the fact that God says the same thing earlier in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. Now, as I've said in the past, I know years ago, it seems like the point of this statement in the Ten Commandments is that we learn that Jesus is the only way to break the effect of sin in our life that left to ourselves, sin spreads. And only Jesus can stop the spread and undo its effects. And by the way, uh, that phrase I realized probably reminds everyone of COVID, but I preached this sermon for four years ago, uh, well before COVID. And I saw that phrase in there, I'm gonna keep it in there because somewhere someone listened to this sermon, used it to shape all of our lives in 2020. So you're welcome. Uh, I'm joking. Uh, But only Jesus can stop the spread of sin in our lives. That's what that means, I think, in Exodus chapter 20. But that does not seem to be the reason here exactly, because here, unlike in the Ten Commandments, the context is not how we live with God, which is the Ten Commandments, right? How do we live with Jesus and each other in this world? The context here is how God lives with us. Now, they go together, obviously, and God, using the same description, tells us they can't be separated, you know, practically in our life, but that doesn't mean they can't be distinguished. And here is the distinction in this text. Having told us all about how gracious and merciful Jesus is and how Jesus doesn't want us to think that, uh, and how Jesus doesn't want us to think that that graciousness does not mean that he is not going to care about the sins in our life. That was an awkward sentence. Having told us that Jesus is merciful and gracious, he does not want us to think that he therefore does not care about the sins in our life that remain. He absolutely does care. And so it seems to me that Jesus says this so that we would know that he remains opposed to sin in our life even while he meets us in mercy and steadfast love. Now, I know sometimes it's hard to see how loving and forgiving someone can go together with standing opposed to sin that remains in their life. But this is actually not a new problem. If you think about the Bible, King David, a man after God's own heart, had multiple wives, uh, even though the Bible told kings not to. He had multiple wives and he had multiple kids, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of kids. And he loved his kids. And David forgave his kids. You could say that he lived with them in mercy and in graciousness. But David did not really stand opposed to sin in his children's life. And the worst example of this is that one of his sons raped one of his daughters. And the text tells us David got really angry and did nothing. He didn't go to his daughter. He didn't approach his son. He didn't go to his other kids. He just felt some feels, and that was it. And it doesn't take much imagination to think of the fallout of that failure to stand opposed to sin. I mean, imagine if what it meant to live with God meant sort of all forgiveness and no opposition to sin in our life. I mean, that wouldn't even be forgiveness. That would be just overlooking bad things, pretending like they didn't happen, closing your eyes. That, that, would, be, that would be awful. Beloved, that's not how God wants to live with us. God does not live with us as somebody who simply lets sin run rampant. 
He lives with us in grace and mercy and also as one who stands opposed to sin so that he can cause us to repent and confess and grow and, and mature us. And this is why we need to know Jesus' whole name. He is the God who lives in opposition to the sin in our life while at the same time walking with us and meeting us in patience and mercy and grace. And that means that living with Jesus will have us experiencing Jesus fight the sin that remains in our hearts while at the same time also letting us experience his patience, his forgiveness, his graciousness, his steadfast love, and his mercy. And that's what I want to conclude with. When we fall into sin, as Israel did here, we need to learn that life with Jesus will not mean that we won't have to address our sins. We will. Israel did. We will have to address them, address them too, because Jesus is going to address our sins, and he's going to oppose them. But we don't need to be afraid of that opposition. We don't need to be worried about the kind of life with Jesus that we will have because the one fighting against our sins is also the one who loves us and forgives us and helps us. He is the one who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love to the thousand generations of those who love him. So let's be glad that the God we live with is named Jesus and that he's revealed his name by living with us in that kind of way. And let's walk with him by faith, that we will always discover him to be uh, rightfully named, the Lord, I am, Jesus. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you live with us in compassion and mercy and that uh, even as you stand opposed to sin in our lives, you still forgive our transgressions and trespasses and sins. You still uh, show us mercy, and you will always show us mercy, and you have proven that by uh, sending our Savior to live and die and rise in our place. Uh, Father, please help us to walk with you in the confidence and the joy that can only come from knowing that we worship the God of mercy and compassion who does not change but who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the one who stands opposed to our sins, but who lives with us in grace. And we pray with this all in Jesus, pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let's stand and sing in response to him number four.